again, everyone. I'm Lat the Redeemed, bringing you another Infinite Magic Raid video. Today, I'm going to be finishing up our three-part guide on starting out and selecting our initial team. As a quick recap, the basic gameplay of Magic Raid is to collect a roster of heroes, build strong teams from that roster, and use those teams to overcome the multiple interesting obstacles that DH Games have built for us. This game has a lot of depth. And it can definitely feel overwhelming when you're just starting out. This guide aims to simplify that complexity to just what you need to know to get started. In our first two videos, which are linked in the comments below, we had created a plan for general progression. We summoned our first round of heroes, and then we discussed the basic outline of how heroes worked. Today, we're going to pull all that together and deep dive into our starting roster of 12 powerful choices and hone in onto a single viable team. That team will take us through the early game and allow us to accumulate the resources we need to progress. So let's get started. Before we look at the individual heroes, let's talk about the types of roles we are going to try and fill. The first are our damage dealers. It can be tempting to create a team filled with just the biggest booming attackers you can find. After all, if you can kill your opponents fast, they won't have a chance to spawn and kill you, right? Not a bad idea, but if it were that simple, the game probably wouldn't be a lot of fun, right? So let's talk about the other two types of heroes for a moment. As a reminder, most heroes aren't one-dimensional. Their various skills often come with a damage component and something else. Defensive heroes generally add some sort of protective skill, such as party shields that go along with their damage output. We also have support heroes that focus on healing your increasing group power through strong buffs, or reducing the effectiveness of your opponents with their powerful debuffs. When we put our first party together, we're looking for the right blend of attack, defense, and support heroes to maximize our flexibility to handle whatever the campaign throws at us. Party also needs to be at least reasonably effective in the arena and in dungeons, or we're going to get stuck in our progression. So, let's dive in. I created a simple spreadsheet for the 12 heroes that we pulled with our first round of wishes. Remember, the list of heroes that you get on your first big round of summoning isn't going to be the same as these, so I want you to focus on how to think about your choices rather than the specific choices that I'm making. And second, you don't need to feel like you have to put together an Excel spreadsheet just to play the game. I've done it here to make it a little easier to illustrate by having everything in one place, and also because I'm more than a little bit nerdy when it comes to Excel. All right, so the first thing I want to do here is I want to sort by the hero type. I want to see all the attackers together, the defenders, and the support heroes together, so I can kind of choose to build this well-rounded party that I need. Now, for a well-rounded party, I want to make sure I have strong damage output, but I also want to give a uh, some defensive capability, uh, as well as some heals, and maybe buffs or debuffs, uh, if we can fit that all in. Now, that's going to be a tall order, with just 12 heroes to choose from, out of the hundreds that are available in the game. But I think we'll be able to do it, and I think you will too, after your first round of summons. So let's just go through our attackers first. Alright, let's start with Ariel. Ariel is a legendary attack hero. She's the only legend that we pulled in the 12 that we got in our Wish Summon. We're going to expand her a little bit because her passive skill has quite a bit of text to it. Let's start with her, her basic attack, her A1. Uh, it's a very straightforward, if maybe a little bit boring, 280% attack damage against a single target. If we take a quick look down through, you'll see that is the biggest single target attack that we have among all of our heroes. She doesn't have an active skill, which is also unusual, uh, in that we can see that all other 11 heroes have something on her on their actives. Let's take a look at her ultimate. Again, very straightforward. It's a theme with Ariel, but it's big. 600% attack damage against a single target just dwarfs anything that any other hero can do against a single target. That could be very, very useful against bosses, very, very useful at knocking down heroes in arena. Uh, I think you get the point. Her passive is also interesting. The first thing is she conceals at the start of every wave. Concealment means that she cannot be selected 
as a target by the enemy. Concealment is removed after taking direct damage. This effect itself cannot be removed. So the only way to get rid of concealment is to get hit, which means most likely through some sort of random attack or an AE attack from the enemy. Now, when concealment is removed, it increases Ariel's damage. And she'll gain concealment again when an ally dies or Ariel gets a kill. Also, on her basic attack or her ultimate, Ariel deals 27% extra damage to the two lowest hit point enemies if Ariel is concealed or stealth. Really powerful. Uh, even though she is a single target attacker, on most of her attacks, because she is concealed most of the time, she's going to be doing significant damage to two additional enemies. I think the massive amount of damage that Ariel is able to do, as well as the protecting conceal, gives a pretty strong likelihood that she's going to make our final team of five. Not to mention she is the only legend that we have. So I'm going to mark her that way to start. Now let's take a look at Gunna. Gunna is an epic attack champion of the Eternal Sect. Gunna's A1, her basic attack is very straightforward. It's 140% attack damage against a single target. Gunna gets an additional attack if the target is under the burn status. For A2, the active attack, she gets two separate 140% attack damage attacks against a single enemy and a 40% chance to add the burn status for two layers. What is burn? The wording on the burning debuff is a little bit confusing, so let me interpret it for you. What it means is that the opponent is going to take 50% of Gunna's attack as damage before they act. Burn is a stackable debuff, and if there are two stacks of burn on an opponent, it means there will immediately be an explosion that does an additional 300% attack damage and removes the debuff of burn. Damage ignores the mitigating effects of the opponent's defense. So it's nice. It's a big boom that happens under certain circumstances. Moving on to gun as passive, she gets plus 18% of the status effect hit. And what effect hit does is increases the likelihood that the opponent will not be able to resist the effect. In other words, it helps Gunna get her burns applied. Her ultimate is an AE. She does 180% attack damage to all enemies, and she has a 40% chance to inflict one layer of burn for two turns. So Gunna is all about burns. If she can get her burns on and she can get them stacked up, then she'll do significant damage to individual enemies. I, don't, I think Gunna is pretty good. I don't know that I'm quite ready yet to put Gunna into the definitely want to have her on the team, so we'll just think about it while we look at the other attack champions. Let's move down to Holder. Holder is also an epic attack champion of the Eternal Sect. Holder's basic attack hits an opponent twice for 60% attack damage on each strike. It also has a 20% chance to add a layer of bleed to an opponent. Bleed is a damage over time debuff that becomes increasingly powerful the more layers are afflicting an enemy. Starts relatively small at 30% and increases all the way to a max of 165%. It ignores opponent defense and is applied at the start of an enemy turn. His active skill is to hit all enemies twice for 50% attack damage on each strike. There's a 20% chance for each enemy to receive a layer of bleed from this skill. Holder's passive adds an additional 24% damage to any target that is under the bleed effect. His ultimate skill increases his own ATK for two turns, thereby increasing his damage as well as adding counterattack for three turns. Counterattack means that Holder will immediately use his basic attack on any enemy that hits him for direct damage. The ultimate also allows Holder to immediately take a second turn. Holder's skills work well together to increase his damage throughout the fight, and I'm impressed. With the number of enemies that use multi-target attacks, Holder will be getting a lot of free damage from his counterattack, and will be able to stack up bleed damage, meaning that his foes are going to face damage that they can't mitig mitigate every turn. I'm going to go ahead and place Holder on the potential team list. 
On to Obero. Obero is one of the free heroes that we get early in the game, rather than one we summoned with a wish rune. Obero is an epic attack hero of the Sword Harbor Guards. His basic attack takes two swings at a single enemy and does a respectable 110% attack damage on each swing. His active attack deals 240 attack damage to a single enemy, as well as inflicting feebleness for two turns. Feebleness is an attribute debuff that increases the damage that an enemy takes by 20%. Obro's ultimate skill attacks a single enemy for 220% and then makes three random attacks against the enemy group. Any attacks against new targets do 220% attack damage, but anything against duplicate enemies only does 85% damage. For his passive skill, Obero has a 24% chance to inflict a layer of bleed for two turns whenever he lands a critical hit. Obero has some interesting skills in his crit, in his kit, especially feebleness, but I am concerned that he's mostly single target focused with his ultimate seeing lower damage in many cases against multiple targets. In addition, while bleed is very nice, it only has a chance to apply when Obero crits. For these reasons, I'm going to leave Obro off our preliminary group list. Let's take a look at Reeves, our final attack hero. Reeves belongs to the Dragon Tribe, same as Ariel. His basic attack hits opponents twice for 60% attack damage and has a 20% chance to inflict a layer of bleed for two turns. Reeves' active skill grants himself counterattack for three turns and increasing his effect hit attribute by 25% for two turns, reducing the odds that opponents will resist the bleed on his basic attack. His ultimate skill hits on a single enemy five times for 70% attack damage on each strike, with a 30% chance of inflicting a layer of bleed for two turns. His passive skill gives Reeves a 50% chance of reducing the cooldown on his ultimate skill every time he uses his basic attack. Reeves' kit is very similar to Holder's, and either are viable choices for the group. However, I don't want to double up on the same basic hero concept, and I'm going to give the nod to Holder here, because his active skill adds some AoE damage that we're currently missing in this group composition. Just as a note, in case you're confused, the wording on some of these skills is a little bit ambiguous, but to clarify, if something says, say, it has a 20% chance to inflict bleed for two turns, that means it has a 20% chance to inflict bleed per attack. So on Reeves' basic attack, for example, has a 20% chance each time the attack is made. On the ultimate, with five attacks on a single target, there's a 30% chance to inflict bleed each attack. So that means in theory, on the ultimate, you could stack bleed five times, though that's unlikely given the probability is only 30%. Sorry if that wasn't unclear before. We've looked at all the attack heroes on our roster, so let's move down to the defense heroes. First up is Christian, an epic defense hero of the Sword Harbor Guards faction. Christian's basic attack makes two hits of 60% attack damage to a single enemy. The second stage of the attack has a 20% chance to inflict stun on the target. Stun is a controlled debuff and means that the target cannot move on their next turn, which basically means that they're going to skip their next turn. Note that controlled debuffs usually don't work on boss enemies, so it is limited to wave foes and guards. Christian's active skill grants the entire party a shield equal to 20% of Christian's max hit point for two turns. Direct damage from enemies must eat through the shield before they reduce hit points. Christian's ultimate is a AoE attack against all enemies that does 240% of Christian's attack. Whenever he takes direct damage, Christian's passive skill has a 24% chance of reducing the cooldown on his ultimate by one turn. Looking ahead a bit into the remaining heroes, I can already see that we don't have a lot of options on healing, which means that Christian's shield is all the more valuable. In addition, I still feel like we're a little bit short on AoE damage to help clear waves in campaign. 
With those factors combined, I'm reasonably confident that we're going to want Christian in our party, and I'm going to mark him as such. Our second and last defense hero is Mu, who is an epic that belongs to the Nameless Brotherhood. His basic attack does 140% damage that scales with Mu's defense attribute and has a 40% chance to inflict a layer of burn for two turns. Mu's active skill does 200% damage to a single enemy, again scaling with defense, and has a 50% chance of provoking for one turn. Meanwhile, Boulder gains a two-turn shield for 20% of his max hit points. His ultimate skill increases his own defense attribute for, by 30% for two turns, thereby increasing both his survivability and his damage output. He also does an AoE of 120% of his defense damage to all enemies, and that has a 40% chance to inflict burn for each enemy. For his passive skill, Burn damage on enemy is calculated on Mu's defense rather than his attack. Anytime Mu attacks an enemy not already under burn, there is a 40% chance that Mu will add a layer of burn for two turns. If a target is under burn, the passive has a 40% chance of reducing the enemy's defense by 30% for two turns. It's an interesting kit overall, with the potential to drive some solid damage. However, I like Christian just a bit better with his guaranteed shield. I'm going to pass on Mu. Let's move on to support heroes now and start with Eden. Eden belongs to the Wizard Eye faction and is a force hero, which means she is not subject to the rock, scissor, paper nature of most hero marks. For her basic attack, Eden does 160% attack damage to a single enemy and has a 60% chance of reducing attack by 20% for two turns. Her active skill is to raise all allies' attack by 20% for two turns, which increases the damage for the entire party. Eden's ultimate skill immediately heals all allies by 8% of Eden's max hit points and grants them a heal over time for the next two turns, which restores 5% of Eden's max hit points each turn. Eden's passive skill increases her own speed by 4% each turn, up to 3 times, or 12% total. I like Eden's kit. She can reduce damage from opponents via her basic attack, she can increase party damage with her active, and she heals damage with her ultimate. It's a very solid healer. I'm going to add her to the team. Okay, we filled out 4 of our 5 spots and have 3 more support heroes to look at. Start with Leah. <clears throat> who is an epic support hero of the Forgotten. Her basic attack does 120% attack damage to a single enemy and has a 60% chance of slowing them down by 20% for two turns. Her active skill does 160% attack damage to her target, as well as two random enemies, and has a 60% chance of reducing target's speed by 20% for two turns. Her ultimate is an AoE that does 200% attack damage to all enemies and has a 30% chance to inflict Hypnotize, which is a control debuff, on each for one turn. Hypnotize is like stun in that it prevents an opponent from moving on their next turn. However, it can be broken early if an enemy is attacked. Leah's passive gives some self-preservation capability and restores 14% of Leah's lost hit points any time a hypnotize effect is removed from an enemy by an attack or via cleansing. I like the speed debuff that Leah brings to the table quite a lot. Attacking first is a huge advantage, and her ultimate would bring some additional AoE to the team. So let's compare that to Reliant and Sylvan. Reliant is an epic force hero of the Sunset Sages. Her basic attack Similar to Leah's, but packs just a bit more punch and scales on defense rather than attack. It is 160% defense damage to a single enemy, with a 60% chance of reducing speed by 20% for two turns. Her active skill is 160% defense-based AoE that includes a 20% chance to reduce speed by 20% for two turns. Her ultimate increases all ally speed for 20% for two turns and grants Reliant another turn. Her 
passive gives a self shield of 20% of her max HP for one turn. It's a solid kit. Finally, Sylvan, who is an epic support hero of the Foresters faction. His basic attack does 140% attack damage to a single enemy and has a 60% chance to reduce their defense by 30% for two turns. His active skill grants all allies a shield of 16% of his max hit points for two turns and cleanses one random debuff from allies. His ultimate skill does 140% attack damage to all enemies with a 25% chance of inflicting intertwined for two turns and a 25% chance to reduce attack by 20% for two turns. Whew, that's a mouthful. Intertwined is a control debuff that has no immediate effect, but after two turns, becomes a stun. For his passive, Sylvan increases the resistance of the entire party by 14% as long as he's alive. That helps reduce the chances that effects from enemies will infl inflict their effect on the party. I had some tough choices here. I rolled out Sylvan fairly early because Christian is already giving us a shield, and multiple shield allies won't be much benefit to us here in the general case. That leaves Leah and Reliant. I could make an argument for either. I think I'm going to choose Leah, though, but it was close. Leah's active skill has a 60% chance of lowering speed on enemies, on three enemies, rather than a 20% on five. I'll take the more likely outcome. Her AoE on her ultimate also hits just a bit harder, and I think that's going to be useful. All that said, I'm relatively comfortable giving the nut to Leah to round out our party. So, our first group that should take us through most of the early game content is Ariel, Holder, Christian, Eden, and Leah. If I'm concerned about anything, it's the relative lack of heals we have. I'd be a bit happier with a heal versus the shield that Christian brings, but one has to work with the options presented. We'll keep an eye out on future wish summons if this turns into an actual problem. Do you agree or disagree with these choices? Let me know in the comments below. Next up for us is going to be to put some very basic equipment on these heroes and set them loose into the game. My goal will be to get as far as possible spending only the minimum resources required to complete the quests which gate off some of the progression. In our next video, I'll report back on how we did and take a deeper look into itemization of heroes and how we extract maximum utility from them. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button and subscribing to the channel. Both of those things are free, but they do wonders to help others find the content by letting YouTube know that you found this information useful. Until next time, this is Lat the Redeemed signing off and hoping you have a great rest of your day.